your job as A&R, I think we should break it all the way down because I wouldn't have known what A&R even was unless I was in this business long enough to know what A&R was. Did you know what A&R was as a kid, though? Did you know? I, the only reason I knew is because I was the kid like reading liner notes mm-hmm. of albums I loved, and you'd see A&R, and I wouldn't know what the heck it meant. Um, I learned what songwriters were, right? You'd see like, different people on every album, but honestly, it wasn't until... Really, like I got into like you know, there's a lot, there's a big like rock, you know, scene. I'd say maybe like mid 2000s, the whole emo thing. And I, one of the guys that works at Warner now, Rohan, he was a uh, managed boys like girls, and I believe he did some A and R work too. And that was the first time when I was like, okay, I know, I recognize his name when like I got older and I'd see him like working in Nashville. I'm like, okay, so what does A and R do? You look it up, and you know, they're just trying to get the song from point A to point B for the artist, try to get the creative part for them flowing, and now I'm in the, the freaking role. It's yeah. pretty wild. So would you say that, I mean, and I don't mean this like Instagram, but I, I, would, I think you're an influencer here. Like you're trying to influence people, just general people, to give songs life. And I, not influence like Instagram. I don't, want, I don't want that to be like you're trying to sell tummy sure. tea. Definitely not a but tea you, guy. But, you know, you're trying to create things of influence and try, or, or trying to make sure the things that are created are influencing the right people. Yeah, the way I'd look at it is if I, at the very least, get regular listeners to understand, like, what songwriting means, especially in Nashville, where it's like, this is, like, a special thing apart from any other genre, then that's when I feel like my job's done. Like, even before I got into this position... That's I had this handle. There's even like, you know, a group I was with before Country Central and just like we made this like country media platform and we just had regular people, you know, voicing their opinions, but also learning about this world, getting a peek into Nashville for people around the country, around the world. And that was the most fulfilling part for me is because people learned like, oh, this is a, I know someone that's only a songwriter. They don't have any artist career but when they see their name, you know, written by for like a new Hardy song or new Wallen song. They get excited and like they're rooting for those people the mm-hmm. same way I am. So that's been the most fulfilling part when I had this going on. When someone comes and let's say you're on a vacation or you're just traveling and they're like, "Hey, what do you do?" and you, "What do you say?" I work in the music business. That's what I say now. Okay, then I say, "Oh yeah, doing what?" I get songs from point A to point B. What's if, what's point A? Point A is the songs created, and eventually we want to get it to. Recorded, obviously, and ideally played on the radio. So and when you hear B on the, would, point B would be who? Point B would be the artist. Got it. The artist you want, a big name artist, ideally, right, that you want it to be recorded by. And then point C, I guess, would be it's on the radio, and that's how, or streaming services. Sure. And that's how you, you all are hearing it for the first time. And I'm just part of that creative process. I'm kind of, you know, I don't want to say giving birth to songs, but I'm part of that process when the song's created. I'm the one networking it out in the world, making sure it gets heard by as many people as possible. They feel the same thing I feel about it. And hopefully the artist that records it feels the same way that multiple people are feeling about it and it's the right time for them to record it. And then hopefully it gets put out in a timely manner, you know, fingers crossed. And then when it, that's the last part. When it has success, that's just really when you see a lot for the songwriters at the very end of the table. You know? What's the big win you've had recently? So I was telling Mike, you know, I just started four weeks ago officially. Um, but I would say a win, a recent win is um, one of the writers I represent, uh, Taylor Phillips. You know, he's written for Kane Brown, wrote Hurricane for Luke Combs. One of his songs, it's not a single on Morgan Wallen's new record, but uh, Think About Me, right? That's uh, just an album track, but it's done one of the best, you know, streaming, sell, you know, sales-wise. And it's just cool to see where it's like, where this idea started, when you talk to them and understand what was going on in the writing room that day, and can start from very small beginnings, and then with this album, obviously one of the biggest ones in a long time. It's just cool to see your people win. You know what I mean? Where'd you grow up? Houston, Texas, born and raised. And so, when you were a kid, let's not even do kid. Let's do tenth grade. Tenth grade. What'd you want to do? Um. So, like, just I guess Cliff Notes version of my life. You know, my family moved here from Nigeria for college, and my dad actually became a petroleum engineer. So oil and gas world, he started his own company when I was around 10 years old, and he moved back to Nigeria and, like, just ran his company from wow, there. Wow, he moved back. I'll suppose, so that was, like, my whole life. You know, we had the oil company, and that was really what I thought I was going to do or thought that was what I was expected to do. So I'd say 10th grade, yeah, I'm getting ready to, you know, go to college and get prepared for all that, and 
in my mind, I'm like, my dad went to USC. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go there too. I'm going to do the whole thing. And got into both USC and UT Austin. And I think it was just – the decision was kind of made for me in the sense of <laughs> USC is $60,000 and UT is like 8000 I think, around the time. And I really didn't want to. You know, you go through a whole process for some of these, like, big-name schools. You go, like, you interview. You do all this crazy stuff. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to be an engineer. Like, this will maybe be my way to get there. And that was where my head was at. I had all these other interests. I loved music. I loved literature. I loved writing. But in my mind, especially the way being first-generation American, the way my parents made it here, I just couldn't even understand or I could, like, I could be doing these other things, these hobbies or interests I had. Could it be a career that's kind of that I expect for myself or is expected of me? So, yeah, it was literally just like I'm doing oil and gas thing. I'm, I'll figure it out, and we'll see what happens. And that's what I ended up going to school for. What did your dad tell you around that time? Was he encouraging of you to do oil and gas or – if you don't want to do oil and gas, do whatever you want. Like, what kind of parent was he there? I think he's a type of parent where the, my dad came from zero. So for him to make it, he just knew, obviously, it took a lot of hard work, but it also took a lot of, like, people betting on you, supporting you. And I think looking back now, I'm 32 years old now, so getting a little older. But looking back now, I think my parents just taught me or told me what they knew. The only reason they got here, had the life they are able to have is because – this is their first experience. And since my myself and my siblings were first generation, they know any other way. So there weren't a lot of different perspectives to say, plenty of our families moved to the States and they've had this type of success. We know this one way. So that's what I definitely had seen. And I think at the end of it all, I definitely put more of it in my own head. I'm sure if I spoke to him, and was like, hey, there's something that I know I could be great at. I'm going to work my butt off at it every single day. Things would have been different. But I know in my head I was very just like point A, point B, either I do A or B. You know, I mean, I couldn't think of like, hey, I'm going to tell you I want to do this and mm-hmm. why. You know, so I feel like I had to go through the process, grow and learn a lot more about myself to now have the type of conversation which I've had with him countless times. Were you as a kid, high school kid, college kid, were you drawn to music because you liked how it made you feel or were you drawn to music because – you wanted to be more part of the creation. And obviously, music makes everybody feel certain ways. But I always would listen to music kind of to escape. Never wanted to really create it. It wasn't until, like, I mean, Adam Sandler music for me and even Ray Stevens where I was like, oh, I can do music, but I can be funny. Because I, I never really wanted to be or I didn't feel like I had the skills or really the effort to be someone who played music at a high level because I, I, I was terrible. So where did that come for you, and what was your passion in music? Yeah, I would say just I, like, I keep coming back to the first-generation thing because there's no rules when it came to, like, entertainment or music for me because my parents knew what they knew. Like, if they didn't know, like, what certain music was or what bands were, like, then they couldn't tell me you can't listen to it, you know? <laughs> so I think my first thing was, like, I saw Nirvana or watched like, music videos about them or saw them on MTV, and that's when I, I was, like, trying to play guitar, and I fell in love with guitar. Where would you get your first guitar? It was a first act guitar from Walmart. So fingers were definitely blistered. Yeah. <laughs> Did not sound great whatsoever. But I taught myself how to play guitar just watching like Foo Fighters music videos, just watching MTV. I'd see a music video, see where their fingers were, and I figured out like a G chord, you know, eventually. Um, but music for me is absolutely an escape. I think growing up, it's like, my siblings and I, we were just kind of figuring out what's our life going to be like. You know what I mean? Like, we're seeing our world through completely different eyes than our parents did. And there's something definitely looking back really, you know, empowering about that. I may not realize it when I was younger, but when I would listen to music, it'd be like I go into my own world. And I think one of the pivotal moments for me, and maybe I memory hold it because I never did anything with music growing up, was um, like our parents sent us to school when we were kids, like grade school, and they would have like academic competitions we'd compete in. And there was one I did called Music Memory, and they'd like maybe play like a, you know, a Beethoven piece, you know, orchestral piece, and time it for like 15 seconds, stop the, you know, the tape, and then you have to just say who composed it, you know, when it came out, things like that, like what was like the prominent instrument or whatever it may be. And I swear that's where I got my ear for, like, when I'd put on my headphones, when, like, you know, CD players were normal. And I would hear, you know, parts of production. I'd hear, like, the strings and appreciate all that part of an arrangement. And whether it was in a rock song, a pop song, a country song, and that always stayed with me. But I was like, 
why do I have all this, you know, random information I know or knowledge about music or who's making it and I'm never going to do anything with it. And I think also when I looked up, like, man, you know, people have to, like, tour on a tour bus and be cram-packed with all their buddies. And I'm like, I don't know, I feel like I get sick, you know, after one <laughs> weekend out on the road. So I, I was like, I don't know if I could ever be a musician. And that was where my brain went. I was like, Did you, you stop have to pursuing, be. like, like practicing to do anything more than just recreational play it? It was all recreational. I did have a band that I was a part of, like, in middle school. And the hardest part was, I mean, I come keep going. If you have a night, if you know what a Nigerian parents like, you're not staying after school at someone's house at band practice. It's like it's not gonna happen. You gotta be, we gotta be at home, you know, studying for other subjects. But I did have a band like in middle school that I was like the lead singer of, play guitar. Um, and I think other than that, I just was like, I'm just always gonna be a fan of it. I'm always gonna have some deeper appreciation for it than like I felt like my siblings had or my other friends had for it. But I just never knew like. What's how am I gonna do anything with music? It just was never a realistic option for me when I was growing up. When did you feel though that it could actually be something that, if you work, you can have a career in it? Because again, it doesn't sound like you're a Dan Smiters yeah. or a. And we could go through a list of them who always kind of knew, even though they didn't target exactly how they were gonna do it, but they've known since they were like seven. And they played and they practiced. And they, because I a bit like you, listened to a ton memorized a ton, found people that I loved that wrote and created, but I knew I wasn't going to be an artist. So when did you have that realization of, oh, I can actually do this and make a living off of it? Because it had to be a job you maybe didn't even know existed. Yeah. So it was after school, and I'd done maybe one job, like in the oil and gas industry, and, you know, just did it to do it and, you know, pays whatever and, you know, wasn't super passionate about it. Um, But I'd moved back to Houston. I was like, you know what? expectations for me I feel are pretty low at this point I didn't I'm not like the superstar superstar oil and gas you know like executive that maybe was like I was thought I thought I was going to be growing up so I was like let me you know I was going online and there was a big country station in in Houston and they were just hiring like for promotions for social media you know for everything and I just applied you know I, I think it was around the time like Sam Hunter just released his first album FGL was really blowing up, and I was like, hey, like, I know these artists. Like, I know the people that produce them, and I have that passion. Let you me just... knew as in, like, you didn't know them personally, you knew who they were. No, I did not know them personally. Right, you knew who they were. I got it, got knew kind of like what was going on behind the scenes, and, yeah, I just rolled the dice, and obviously, you know, they always need more radio promo people. Yeah, you're overqualified, like, by 120%. They always want more <laughs> radio promo Yeah, they're like, I, I can't hire you. You're too, <laughs> too smart for all this stuff. Um, so I got that gig, and that's really when I dived in, and, like, I was learning the radio part of the country music world. And um, we'd have artists like Jimmy Allen come to the studio, Riley Green when he was starting up. And I was working like the Houston Rodeo, setting up at Cody Johnson shows and a little bit of everything, you know, like working the late nights at a bar, you know what I mean? And from where I would started growing up, that was just never a side of life that, you know, I feel like I ever thought I would do, you know, where I'm like people literally can, this is part of like a career where people grind out, it could be like late nights, like 4 a.m., but all throughout, you're networking, you're learning about people, you're meeting the people that are in the industry, and also learning from, like, I had a program director, um, Johnny Chang, I think now he's at Pandora, and I would just ask him, pick his brain, like, when he had time, when, and I'd be asking him technical stuff about, hey, why, why this single, or why does, a, how can a big artist have this huge single, and then they release this to one, like, we don't give as much play, and he would just, like, describe to me the way the world worked, and that was super fascinating to me. And I think all throughout then, I was like, it'd be great just to visit Nashville. I'd never been up to that point. Um, that was right before the pandemic hit. I was like, it'd just be cool to visit. Maybe one day, one day, if I, I, could, I could move out here with just a job. I wasn't even thinking it'd be a music job and I'd be in Nashville. Big. It'd be great just to live here, be in this environment that's inspiring. And yeah, the pandemic hit and then radio kind of you know, got pretty quiet for a little bit. Um, and that's when I got the last job that I had, which is like IT tech, you're selling the software, <clears throat> working with all sorts of companies. But, um, I had to quit obviously my radio jobs cause it's like, Hey, I need to have a full-time job making good money. And around that time, unfortunately my dad had gotten sick. So he'd moved back home from Nigeria to Houston. So like, I was like, all right, at least let me have a full-time job, help out with my family where I can. And I don't know, that's just my reality now. You know what I mean? So radio, I wasn't doing that anymore, but I was still in tune with what was happening. That was kind of around the time when I was like, you know what? It's the pandemic. I love music. 
let me just play some country song guitar, not for any reason, not to be seen, but I'll just do it. It's during a pandemic. It's like a release in a way, and you post on Instagram or whatever. Maybe one person sees it. Who cares? And, um, yeah, that's kind of how the ball got rolling, I'd say, and what, as what far happened? as me using you, you, social media. So you posted something on social media. You posted a song, whatever. Sure. What, what, how hard did that ball roll? Like, what, did, what happened it, from there? It didn't roll at all as far as that's concerned. It just became a collection of, like, okay. me on guitar or me maybe talking about a country song I was really passionate about. Are you a good singer? I'd say I'm a very silent background vocalist. I, I'm not a singer. If you were you singing on your TikTok Instagram, this video is now private on YouTube. But I'd done <laughs> a Luke Combs like he has a song called Moon Over Mexico, and I'd sang along to it. Obviously, out of key, and like just like a couple people commented saying like, "Oh, very nice." And then one guy says, "Brother, you're so out of tune, out of key." <laughs> and then the dude that commented below is like, "I give you props for even putting that up there." By the way, like I'm Luke's like videographer on the road, like. Props. And I was like, that was one random moment where I'm like, random people can see everything, you know what I mean, out there in social media world. Do you know who said that? The videographer? I don't know if he's still with him. Okay. But I, I, I'll look back I know Luke's sure. videographer now. Yeah. And I, but I thought you were going to say, like, you low-key put up a video and it got 20 million views. And the next thing you know, you're in Nashville. Singing. The, I, no. no <laughs> That's no what singing. I thought. No, like I'm singing. not a Broadway singer got it, got in it, the got least. It. But I'd say the first light bulb moment for me just using social media was... I had done like a like a little singer review, like a, a song review about like a deep cut of an artist like Orion Heard. And he had a song called Michigan for the Winter. That's my favorite song by him. And I want to say it's like pretty, you know, it was 2020, like maybe getting close to 2021. I just did like a write up about it, what the certain, you know, hook made me feel, like the way the song was arranged, you know, like me just deep diving into songs. And then he like had reached out to me. It was just like, dude, thank you so Ryan much. Did? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I was like, thanks so much for the deep dive. Like, that's how I was feeling when I wrote the song. And then I was like, there's actual, like, real people behind the screen. You know what I mean? That was the first thing that came to my mind. And second was like, man, these people see everything. You know what I mean? And in this crazy world of social media, it's like, y'all are looking, at, you're all seeing everything. And so it was cool for me when I was like, just being a fan, being passionate about the craft that someone that I respected noticed. Um, and from there, I got involved with the group called Country Central. That's like another social media platform. And how did how do you say from there? But how did that happen? Did they contact you? Did completely, you email them? completely remote. I mean, I'm just at home on my phone. And the guy that started, he had been doing just maybe some news posts, maybe talking about like accolades in the genre. Like someone was going number one with certain singles, and I'd just be the guy in the comments being like, "Oh, congrats to Ashley Gorley for his like." 50th, 60th, number one, you know, and I would just know the songwriters and I'd like, you know, shout them out. And he, uh, the guy that started eventually reached out to me. It's like, how do you know everything about these people that are writing it, blah, blah, blah. And I just said, hey, I'm just a fan of like what they do, but hey, I'm definitely a fan of like how he's a very good graphic designer. The guy that started it, just videographer, graphic design, acumen. And we just had a Zoom call because he's like, he was in Florida, I was in Texas. You're just putting comments. Now, educated, knowledgeable yeah. comments. But That's just it. Putting, wow. Just being myself. I think that was maybe the first time I'm like, hmm, I could be completely myself and there's maybe some kind of value linked to that. And that's kind of what got the ball rolling. I mean, he and I had one Zoom call for like close to two hours and I was just like, hey, dude, you have a very good like sense of like what's eye catching. Like you have like 15 seconds to like catch people's eyes before they tune out. And he was doing it in a space of country music where, of course, there's like the standard bearer companies and media, like CMTs of the world, like the boot, things like that. But for social media, for like a lot of younger generation, I don't really know what's like the, the place people go to to like catch up on what's going on in the country world. And I just told him, I'm like, hey, like if you want to focus on the up and coming artists in town, the established people, if we could write reviews, you know, interview artists. Maybe um, I told him if I could interview like a songwriter that wrote a big song and like regular listeners can be like, could now know who that person is, have an appreciation for the work they do, then that'd be my that'd be my goal you know and from there like things did like really get rolling that's crazy and it also shows you that just put out stuff out that you're passionate about that you know i mean the fact that you were just putting up reviews on a, I imagine a small yeah. tiktok or instagram account sure i mean no offense i don't think it was 10 million i don't have 10 million but it's i mean not it's, it's not mil. right that's it's what i'm saying and ryan reaches out and goes hey i appreciate that and you're like wait people see this stuff like, I would have the same... I'd be surprised, too. That's the way I always looked at it. And then you're writing comments. 
and your comments were so good. My comments suck. I just get in fights in comments. <laughs> That's all I ever I, do. My whole um, you know, adage is like, I like to hopefully use technology for good, not evil. And I just think with the pandemic, my dad being ill, like I just was in a place where I was like, I need to be a good person. I better be like, we've all gone through a craziness with the pandemic and like coming out of that. I don't want to waste my time being on social media, like fighting with people. I just saw where with music, we could come together with certain songs that were coming out during the time, just seeing how people were resonating with country music, especially after the pandemic, it kind of blew up with streaming, you know, obviously with Morgan Wallen and other artists were seeing like more success than ever after that. And I think we kind of were at the right place, right time to be covering it in like a creative way. And um, that's what really got me out to Nashville. Like I, I visited, I want to say maybe April, Easter, 2021, and that was like right when like Nashville was like reopening yeah. a little bit from everything. And um, funny random story. I remember like the first place I go to on Broadway is like Tootsie's. Like I've never been there before. And like I'm wearing my mask and everything. And I walk up the stairs and <laughs> there's like Bachelorette group like walks up to me. And they're like, why are you wearing that? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> good to meet you. You know, cool. I'm in Nashville first time. Great. I was like, I don't know y'all. And like don't want to, you know, rub anyone the wrong way. Just being safe. And this girl's like, I'm a nurse. And I'm not even wearing one. <laughs> I'm just like. This is Nashville, I guess. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, I think I came for the first time, fell in love with it. I was like, this is an environment that inspires me. Um, caught some riders rounds while I was in town. And with Country Central, we just had a lot of opportunities to catch a lot of shows. Because by the time when we were covering artists or writing reviews, I mean, number one, like songwriters that I was a fan of, I would just literally tag them when I'd write a review. Like They'd see it. They'd reach out and say, hey, I'm really, I really appreciate you, like, spotlighting what we do because it could be a big single it could be just a random song that comes out on a friday that will never go to radio but i was writing like we we're writing in-depth reviews about it spotlighting like the hooks the production of it and like i don't know giving a little more const- you know, constructive maybe feedback to it than just this is good or this sucks you know what i mean i always wanted to give people like this is why to me it's good here's a certain line i think resonates with a lot of people Here's a producer they work with that I think really highlights what they do really well. And artists were reaching out because it's Instagram, right? They see everything. All you got to do nowadays, you tag someone and that button. they might happen to look at it. Mm-hmm. And when I guess when they'd look at certain things I'd post, I don't know, man. I'm not, I know there's two sides of social media, but for me, like, I truly was just trying to use it to like, be myself and hopefully kind of shout out people I think are really talented, really special. And I think because of it, I got connected and was networking with a lot of people in town. And when we come to town, we would have opportunities to interview artists. You know, I think we'd gone out to one of Morgan's shows in when in San Antonio. So like he he was there, and I got to interview Hardy on that tour. And for me, like I was like a huge fan. But I think when you're kind of like doing like a job, it's like cool. This guy gets to work. We go, we you know, go wrap to his bus, have the interview. I think after stuff like that started happening, when we came to town and we're like, hey, we're in town, would love to connect with any artist writers. And we had like an Airbnb, like, you're welcome to come by the house. We'll set up the camera. We'll do like a you know impromptu interview. And the one cool story I have is like we had met, I think Connor Smith had played um, Whiskey Jam. And Dylan Marlowe was there, him, and then his co-writers, Joe Fox and Jimmy Bell, who wrote Last Night Lonely for John Party. So, like, we got to know them, and I was like, hey, like, I'm in town for a week, have an Airbnb. Me, just being me, would love to interview y'all's songwriters. Just have you by the house, learn your story, learn how you wrote Last Night Lonely, all that good stuff. So, had Dylan, had Joe, had Jimmy all by the house, just got to learn their story. And, like, I've kind of, I just kind of learned, like, with the interviews, you have notes and you have rules, but when you're just having a one on one conversation, learn about people's lives, like, you can kind of relax and just let it happen naturally. And that's what I found myself doing. I'd be having interviews and I'm like, I'd have like a note, but then it's just letting them kind of lead the way and like whatever they bring up, I'd take it that direction. And I felt very natural doing it. And with the last night lonely deal, we had interviewed them, but in the same week, one of my buddies, I don't know if you're familiar with him. His name is Grady Smith. And he has this like YouTube, he makes like money just doing country, you know, country music media through YouTube and, talking about the industry, all that good stuff. And he had had an interview set up with John Party that week. And he's also thinking about moving to town. So I was like, I have a couch you can crash. You're welcome to. 
So a couple days later, John Party rolls up in like you know to our Airbnb. So that's the first time I met him. <laughs> Super nice guy. Um, the, he even was like nice and gracious to like the Airbnb owners that are house like nearby and like they were freaking out. But um, he sits down and like I'm just literally filming it. But he's a very interactive guy. So Grady's interviewing him, but then he's talking to me, asking me questions, and we kind of ask him about last night lonely. I'm like, you know, we actually had like the guys by the house like the other day. He's like, I've actually never met them before. And it's always funny, obviously, to learn, you know, now me being in publishing, music publishing, just knowing where a song can start and how it gets to the artists, uh, you know, eventually. And how a lot of times with the schedules y'all have, like, you guys never have time to even hang out in person. You know what I mean? And I just thought it was like a really cool wrinkle in like how a song comes to be. And at that time, I think the song was rising. Obviously, it would eventually go number one. But, um, yeah, John's a great guy. And it was just a very cool experience where I, I'll just be myself in town and these random opportunities were coming my way. You know what I mean? Just to interact with these people, connect the dots, and, yeah, just tell them, hey, like, if you have music coming out, let me know. And that's something that Country Central we did a good job at as, like, putting this big release calendar up where, like, every Friday we're telling you every single country release coming out. So regular listeners would be like, we're super grateful. I know who my favorite artists is putting out music. And then for up-and-coming artists, they were really appreciative too because they're getting spotlighted just as much as, like, a Morgan Wallen through our platform and that was just i think that's how i really made my connections with a lot of the up-and-coming people that like, are doing well today and then like just same thing like the, like the ryan herds of the world mean something like john and even like thomas Rhett. that was probably the most random you know connection because like he had reached out out of the blue because i just was a big fan of him and i think he had gotten like 20 number ones recently and i just kind of had it compiled like my list of top tr songs and I think he, not everything was like a huge hit. It was maybe some of the deeper cuts he had done. And I think maybe he saw that he liked those songs too. And he had reached out to me just out of the blue and was like, Hey man, like would love to like send you some demos, get your opinion on them. Like what's your number? And I was like, all right, this just, this town natural was like insane. <laughs> like, y'all have the crazy schedules and I don't know why you have time to reach out to me about anything. But that was really, I think when I was like, I'm tr- in the craziest time of my life. Like, I'm still in Houston at the whole time. I'm coming out to Nashville, like, on PTO, you know? Like, all this amazing stuff happening. And I just know, knew throughout it, all of it, like, just keep being yourself. Treat people right, you know what I mean, that you come across. Don't get caught up in social media nonsense, but just I live keep there, it. Yeah. I live in nonsense, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get caught up. I'm caught up right now. Every, it's every it's tough, yeah. right? It's yeah. easier said than done. But, you know, keep it on the craft. If I'm just like, hey, I love country music. I love the craft of songwriting and I want everyone to know as much as possible about this world. So as fans, you can just appreciate it even more. And like, I think because of that, just all this good kept coming in my life. And I keep coming out to Nashville and yeah, eventually got here. But how did the Warner people, I mean, it had to be, you met somebody that knew somebody then also saw what you brought. I mean, networking is, it's such a big part of life. More than I ever knew. Me too. Same. More than I ever knew because I, I used to not care at all. But it's like, can you meet the right people and then show them that you're going to have a good attitude and the work ethic and be able to take coaching, right? I, I've always felt like for me that was the process. But you got to get to the person that gets to make the decisions. Yeah. So how did you get to the person? Yeah, this is kind of another one of those like, you know, God things, universe things where obviously I've been in town like with certain Warner you know, Chapel, the publishing company, like writers, like Connor Smith is like a writer for right. Warner Chapel. And I think pretty much just my name was getting around in that way to where like my current position, just A&R manager, one of the, you know, directors there had like you know, heard my name, just seeing what was going on, just either when I was in town and what was going on, obviously like, online, just connecting the dots, spotlighting a lot of their artists. And he just reached out to say like, hey, dude, like I see you're in town. Would love just to meet you. Just he just reached out to say, or they just called you. Just reach out. Like you didn't go, hey, everybody's Benji. Anybody want to hire? I'm, I don't think I'm that kind of guy, but I know I have to be now. You got to be in people's faces in Nashville to get your music heard. But was literally just like, hey, like I see what y'all are doing. Just Dang. curious what your plan is in town. Like, what are you even looking to do? And I think that was the first time in a long time when I was like, could I see myself, you know, being in music? Like, is there a pathway? You know what I mean? And because for a long time, I had to kind of close my mind off to that, you know, because I know there's a lot of different routes to get into the music business. But for me, I'm like, I'm 32 years old. I'm like, I got a lot going on at home. Like, is this just going to be my life? You know, sometimes it's easy to get resigned to that fact. 
And just when that happened, I'm like, maybe there is an opportunity. And all I have to do is raise my hand and ask, you know, what's the process? What does it look like? What do y'all even have available? You know what I mean? But at that time, I think I just was getting to, it's a get to know type of thing. What are you looking to do? You have the country central thing. You have your platform. What are who, you who looking calls to you? do? Um, I don't know if you know him. His name's uh, Spencer Noe. Okay. Yeah, great guy. And we just hung out for like two hours. Just He's got still to there. know each other. Still there. A lot of two-hour calls with you. Is that the minimal? Like you got to Zoom two hours. I think you got to hang out two hours. I think get a when like you like get one-on-one with people okay. and you talk about life, it just, for me, like that's just when you learn, you appreciate where people come from, like what it took for them to get to where they're at today. And I don't know, just, I think I can relate to just given like my background, my family, like I definitely appreciate hustlers and people that grind it out. And yeah, just honestly, after that, I think we just left as like we got along, liked him. He's a good person to know in Nashville. So no job was talked about, really. You just wanted to learn about the job, but they weren't like, "We want to hire you." Yeah, I just wanted to learn about his world, what it all took to get into that. And honestly, I think in those kind of positions, that companies like that, I mean, people don't leave usually. You're usually in your place, your position for years, and like then maybe a promotion comes up, maybe something opens up, but. As far as getting in there like that, it usually doesn't happen. So, I mean, I went home, and I want to say it was maybe before the holidays, just this past, you know, this past year where there was just some movement. Just someone happened to, for whatever reason, was leaving, you know, the company. And I got another call just saying, hey, I, you know, there's going to be some changes at the company. And I thought of you, you know, like I happened to have met with the team just casually, just went to the office, met them kind of learn what they all did, how they got to where they came to be. And um, so they met with the president, Ben Vaughn. You know, who I know well. Real, you know, my namesake, you know what I mean? And great guy and just no real offer, but it was just like, but when that call came in, I was literally working my regular job, you know, trying to get a deal, you know, get a contract signed, you know, before a Friday or something like that. And just like, hey, like, I thought of you. Just there's like no promises, but like there's some sh- a shift of change here and your name came to mind and just would, if you're interested – we can start talking about it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? I really didn't know what to think. And I feel like at that point in my life, I'm not one to like be like, it's happening, absolutely. Even if it's something I, I manifest, I, I'm never one to say, of course. Because I, I feel like at this point in my life, I try to live in as much reality as possible. Not to say I don't dream as much, but like when, I don't know, like my dad's sick at home. And it's like, when you get to see that, you're like, let me appreciate the present. And you're not really thinking about what could the future be like? But when that offer came in or that opportunity came in, I was like, great. This is uh, something I definitely think I could do. I know it could do, especially when I heard, like, what it's all about. Yeah, and, what is it all about? What do you tell you? Like, this is what you're going to do daily. Yeah. Like, I would ask that. Like, what do I do every day? Absolutely. What did you ask him? What did he say? He just told me you're pretty much going to be an advocate for a group of songwriters or artists that write as well. And you're going to be the person pretty much supporting them incentivizing or networking songs throughout the community to get them in the right hands. Hopefully it's someone that's going to you know, record a song that gets on the radio. And when I just saw a lot of it was number one, you're going to be diving into a song catalog from decades, you know, that Warner owns and even songs like that, you're going to try to find a home for them if they've never been recorded before. Then number two, you're networking with people in town, obviously trying to build relationships where when time, the timing's right, there's like, something mutually makes sense for everybody that's when you know you get a song in the hands of a right artist and then finally you know just i guess being myself being like an advocate for songwriters and i was like i know i could do that i feel like i've been i think that was all thing like you we feel like you've been doing that really just not officially and i was like i agree and really just wanted to know what the rest of the steps looked like what would it take for me to get there and i think it was like we can talk about it you know Again, the new year, we'll come back, and I was planning to be in town anyways for that because I had to actually come to town to interview Chase Rice before his record came out. So I was like, hey, I'm in town anyways. I'm going to take another meeting there and you know talk to Ben Vaughn about what things could look like. And Ben Vaughn's like, meet me at a Waffle House in Brentwood. <laughs> I was like, all right, great. And I think at that time I was, I was on PTO for my job. I still brought my backpack and my work laptop because I'm pretty sure I had a meeting like at 3 p.m. after I was going to meet up with Ben, and I need to, you know, like call in, just be there, be present. And, you know, hung out with Ben a little more, and, like, we we'd met each other a couple times, had a couple conversations, and he just started going through, like, these are the people you could be working with. Here are the kind of riders you might have a chance to work with, and it'd be a lot of familiar names, people that I already knew either personally or I'd always been a fan of. And he's like, yeah, like, that's going to be your job is to 
they have a catalog of songs and you're going to be the person pretty much evangelizing for them, making sure that these songs find a home. And I was like, I don't know. I've never been more excited than just thinking about what I could be doing in a job. And truly, I mean, I went home still after that trip and it was more like informal, like this could, this is probably real. But for me, it was not real until like I got like an HR phone call. I was just like at home in Houston and they're like, Hey, (laughs) like what's going on? Like, how are you doing? And where are you at as far as like in the job thing? Like, are you looking anywhere else in the industry? I was like, I'd interviewed for another job in like my current field, but um, non-music. And they're like, well, this offer still stands if you want it. Dang. And it's like a dream. It's literally like a you dream. were doing because you were just passionate about it. Not really pursuing a job because who even knew that how to get into that job? And you just exactly. did it consistently and passionately. And then it came up and knocked on the door. And I moved within, I was telling Mike, I moved like within like two, three weeks. I think they're like, could you start in February? I was like, I also could start really quickly. But I was like, <laughs> let me be smart and give myself a buffer and not just be like overwhelmed. And um, I think I just, I started like at the end of February. And I think the last time in my old job was like on a Friday. And I literally packed two suitcases and flew out that following Saturday to Nashville full time. And um, luckily, since I'd come out here so many times and I'd use the same Airbnb to interview artists and stay there, um, when those owners knew I, was, I had an opportunity out here, they're like, you can just stay here while you get settled. And it was one of those ways where I could come here and be very comfortable. You know, I mean, I wasn't just like, where do I go? Right. I don't know anybody here. I'd come a ton the past two years. Which and is what it feels like. When I moved here, I didn't know anybody, mm-hmm. didn't know anything about the town. Didn't. That's, that is really a comfortable situation. I'm not complaining. I'm a yeah. big fan of it, and I was able to kind of hit the ground running here in town and just super grateful. It's just one of those situations that I'm like, I know I'm blessed because of it, and the work I get to do to serve people here in town, like, it is super fulfilling. I think that was something growing up, I was always good at, like, serving on behalf of people I cared about, and sometimes it's kind of hard to serve yourself the same way. Sometimes it's easier to do for others is what I found, and kind of the perfect job, you know what I mean, to be like you serve people every single day, and you find creative ways to, you know, get their name out there, to get their songs heard by the right people. And um, so far, like four weeks in, but, you know, I'm loving it already. There's something new to learn every single day. I'm definitely not finished product, but it's uh, it's definitely, I think, for me, the best job because I get to be myself, like 150%. You were with Neon Union before you came over here? Just had lunch for, with them. Yeah, so what what's it like meeting with those guys? Like, what was the purpose? The purpose is, right, so I had a, a roster of writers, right, that I had to, that to represent. And Neon Union is one of those, you know, as a duo, they're my writers. And they had just gotten off, like, a long slog, you know, a radio tour, you know, for a long time. And they finally just got back into town where they could just relax and also have rights with other writers in town, you know I mean, on their calendar. And I was like, I, I talked to, you know, some of the members, you know, back and forth, like, on online, on Instagram, texting them. But I'd never met them in person, so it's like, hey, like they're actually in town. Let me just meet y'all to hang out with you, get oh, to see, know you. First time you met them in person. First time I met them in person. Yep. First time skin to skin contact. We shook hands. There we dapped up. Skin we did to everything. Skin contact. That's yep. what I'm saying. It's important. And what? You, how'd you feel about those guys? Oh, I mean, they're great. They are they're great. very, very, you know, down home guys. Incredibly talented though. Like just their backgrounds, it's amazing. Like Leo of Neon Union, like. His background, like working for, with Pitbull, writing songs with him, and they're bringing a ton to Nashville. Where, you know, it's not like they're just waking up and saying, "I just want to write a song." It's like they're coming with a lot of knowledge of you know what they want to do and have like a very good ear for what a big song should sound like. And I'm just really excited to get them into rooms with a lot, a lot of different kinds of people, and they're just excited to get to work, man. I mean, just talking to them like. They're very, very motivated by, you know, being on the road, doing the radio tour, meeting a lot of people, you know, around the country, making those connections. And I'm like, that's kind of what I'm doing here, you know, just coming into town, meeting as many people as possible and just learning everyone's story. And then I'm saying, well, where where's the alignment where we could work together that makes sense for the benefit of our writers and artists? You know what I mean? And that's what I got from them. Just people ready to do whatever. They're ready to write with any kind of person. Um, Warner does a lot of camps, you know, a lot of like riding camps with like we just had like an Asia Pacific one. They did like a Latin America one, and like I have a friend who did a Latin America one, and he's like, I'd never written Latin music in my life. And they and you make it happen, you figure it out, and it, it's really been cool, like kind of see that you know walking in the office every day, 
And they're like, oh, we'd love to do that type of collaboration. So, like, it's cool, you know, where you have riders. And a lot of the people I work with, they're just like, we just want to dive in. We're open, more open than I ever thought people would be. Like, you may know a rider, an artist, just outside looking in. You sit down with them, and they're like, we just want to be as creative as possible. And that's probably the best part about this town is everyone just wants to be creative. And I think, honestly, in the, tw- like, 2021 and, and going on, I'm like, I always would joke like on Instagram or social media, I'd be like, this is the best time to be a fan and a creative in my mind. Like there's still like a framework you work out of, but there's really not a lot of rules for right. a listener at the end of the day. They only know what they know. And I think bec- after like, you know, the pandemic and streaming blew up for country music, it's like fans are down to listen to anything and everything. And whatever's classified as country, there's so many different lanes that, in my mind, everything co- can coexist in, and now I get to kind of work with every kind of writer, every kind of artist, and that's just so fulfilling for me as like a music fan, you know, at heart. Final four questions. Number one, will you explain to people listening to this that may not know the difference in a publishing deal and a record deal, like a recording deal? For okay. sure, right? So a publishing deal, that is literally you as you're going to go to work as a songwriter. All you're going to do day to day is you're going to get in a room with maybe two other people, three other people, and you go sit down, throw ideas around, get some lyrics, hopefully some melody, and you're going to write a song. And you're going to be contracted to that. We write with the hopes of a song that you write will eventually be either recorded by a big artist and hopefully either does well on streaming or on radio. And then that's how you're going to see, you know, some success out of that. Whereas a record deal, that's literally you're an artist. Your whole goal is to record songs, either ones that you've written by yourself or ones that have been written by somebody in the industry. And you're the one on the road. You're the what you're facing the magazines. That's a recording contract. A publishing deal is definitely where your craft is songwriting. You know, I mean, I think that's the easiest way to break it up is songwriting. You are behind the scenes writing the songs that we hope are cut and recorded by some artists that a lot of people know about. But recording contract is you're growing into the face of a brand second question when you get a publishing deal are you paid a salary and can you make more than that salary every single deal is different i think that's what i talked to ben advice like every single deal is different depending on the writer you're signing or the artist you're signing i mean i'm sure there's a lot of standard deals where you are making a salary of sorts but of course as you probably know with radio i mean if a song does very well on radio if it goes number one if it's even like top five, I mean, there's definitely incentives. There's ways that people can make more money, you know, with royalties. So based on how well that their songs are recorded do. And I know with streaming, there are ways to make money, but with songwriting, it's, it's definitely tough just as it is today and it's getting better. But um, yes, every situation is different because every person that's coming to the table for a, a songwriting or a publishing deal, I mean, they may be coming in with, you know, different chips to the table some people may be brand new to town some people may be a very known quantity so every deal is different so got a couple friends when they moved here they made like 40 grand a year that was recoupable if they made over it they reached that limit and then they made money if their song they made a percentage of the money once their song started to make money is that common at all now is that still common ish for sure it doesn't I mean, mean that not that amount of money but it's like i gotta eat so can i make $45,000 a year plus whatever I can make if the song does well. Absolutely. And, and obviously you can get technical with it, right? Because, I mean, some people own, right, the masters. Right. And not everybody's going to have that type of situation when they get into, you know, into the music business. But I think there are a lot of different ways people can make money through songwriting. And I don't know, as advocates for it, we're always trying to find more avenues for our people to make as much money as possible. So, like, that's kind of the goal. And, I'm grateful just to, to see that with technology, things are opening up. I mean, more people are fighting for that. And, um, yeah, I think we're getting closer to a day where you can just be a songwriter for a living. And even I think I think maybe the good thing about a 36-song album from Morgan Wallen is you can have a song, be just an album song, but go insane on streaming to the point where you're going to get close enough where people can actually make some good money off of that. So I, when people complain it's too many songs, I say – no, just because there's so many outside songs, I think, that were cut off of that record that would never have seen the light of day otherwise. And I don't know. It's kind of like people are work their whole you know life every single day of the year to write just the best song. And Morgan Wallen had options to choose, like, the best songs from these group of songwriters. 
and you got to pull all those on his record. And for me, it's a big win for uh, Nashville, you know, because it's so many different kinds of publishers were involved in it. And, um, yeah, it's just, you don't see it all the time anymore. So it was really cool by, you know, him, his team to be like, we're just going to pick the best songs. And John Party does a great job about that too, just picking the best song. And um, Ch- Chesney's another guy who picks, and, you know, you may not work with him directly, but, yeah. you know, he's a guy who just goes to and is like, I don't need to write the songs. There, there are people who are great at songwriting. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to grab the best songs. Absolutely. Yeah. Cole does that too. As a great songwriter, he will go and still say, yeah, I'm a good songwriter, but sometimes the song is written better than what I have. Agreed. And he will openly go, I'm looking for good songs. Agreed. And I admire that, especially from the people that are gr- great songwriters that still go, I may be good or even great, but it doesn't mean I'm great all the time and I have every great song. So I think that's pretty cool. Question three or four. Dan Smyers, we mentioned him earlier. You know Dan at all? I do because I got the, you know, had the pleasure of interviewing him. And I guess my joke with that was like, I think it was during like the football season. So like he, it was like we interview people on Sundays at Country Central, and I mean I know he's a huge Steelers fan, so he took like the whole game off to like interview with us. And yeah, he's also like you said, he's very like in tune. He's the guy kind of he produces. He I think you said tracks. control freak wrong, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> he's very particular about how his product is, and I don't know. He was somebody where. He just he dived into everything. He's and, an OCD genius. And I think the cool thing for me, just interviewing him, is that I was a huge fan of just like what he did before he even got with Dan and Dan Shea became what they are. And I believe it was him and Andy Albert. And I remember following them because I listened like to the some, rock stuff. I listened to like the rock band he yeah. was in before he moved to Nashville. And then when him and Andy like, got together, they had a group called Bonaventure. And I just remember seeing like this is a guy I knew that toured the bands I loved as a kid, and he's in Nashville. And when Dan and Shea really blew up, I was like. I'm just happy that someone that I've followed for so many years is like seeing a ton of success. And then for literally almost like 10 years later for me to like interview him, be able to talk to him on the phone about whatever. It's just like, this guy is like a student of the craft, like just loves music more than anybody. And just to learn really just how Dan Shea came to be the grind that he took to get to where he is today. And then his process of around recording music, writing music and how he stays creative working with other artists. It's just like, it was the most inspiring thing, you know, talking to him. And then even before I got this job, like, I think I texted him and I think we're like, talking about, hey, this is an opportunity. It could happen. And I remember telling him, like, yeah, like, you know, obviously I know I could do it and I want it. But, like, you know, I didn't grow up, you know, think I was going to do this. I didn't go to school for this. And he, like, stopped me. He's like, dude, like, stop thinking that way. You know what I mean? Like, if you care enough, if you're, you obviously have passion for it and something that you love, and if you keep that as your focus, I mean, you're going to be successful at it. And I don't know. I mean, he didn't have to tell me that. You know what I mean? Yeah, Dan's A+. Plus. Exactly. And he's he, A+. Plus he's just, dude. like, one of the best people that I've met in this town. And I don't know, man. Again, the opp- like, I, like I said, with my life, it's, like, it's just funny when you least expect it. Just the craziest opportunities, blessings come your way. And just me being here, like you said, it's a dream for me. It's something I never thought would have been possible. Last question for you. So I recorded a song called Hobby Lobby Bobby. Probably heard it. It's massive hit all over the world. Right. And I think I made, like, so far, like fifty one thousand dollars from this one song, right? Which I'm feeling pretty good pretty about because I never. It's not a song that we. When did planned. it come out? Uh, it's been. I mean, it's nineteen sixty four or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's been out like five years, though, four or five years. But we, I never, we put out, and I put out my stuff as just basically promo material, sure. right? No one's going to stream this stuff over and over. It's a live comedy record, and we do this. But it's done pretty well. Now I will sell it to you guys for one million dollars. Would you? T- would you like to have it? Yes or no? Well, one. The song or your catalog? Oh, I'm not selling the catalog. That's worth far. That's worth a hundred million. I'd have to go full Aldine on you guys. One Hobby Lobby Bobby, one million dollars. What do you say? Take or leave it. I was. Ooh, is it featuring? Is this the one you did with like when Jordan Davis and Laney were on? Oh no, that's a recent one. That one's called Opening Act. I feel like we have more lanes with hey, more people. You know what? Part of it. Two million dollars for that one. For both together. No, just for that second one. Yeah. I got a feeling I'm gonna have a I, talk to, I need to talk yeah. to our I need to talk to our CFO. <laughs> okay, at good Warner. deal. He, uh, you know, he, he's the he's the numbers gotta, guy. Got to shoot your shot. It'd be close. You know, very. I know you guys are working on thin <laughs> margins here, but you know, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, no, you're right about the songwriter issue too. And I have friends that have testified on the on the hill, and it is something that it's just like it's such a craft and an art. And if it did not exist there would be a lot of art that we don't appreciate as much because we have it, but something has to be done, you know? And I've also, uh, well, I was going to say under the covers, that ain't the right term, but behind the scenes talked to some lawmakers as well, 
uh, you know, a couple senators, a couple former senators, and radio, streaming. It is such an um, ill-appreciated art. And I don't do it near the level of what the great songwriters in town do here. Listen, I just write co stupid comedy stuff. But even then, I like, it at least gives me the respect. Although I will say, Ben was the head of a deal that we did, me, Nicole Gallion, and Ross Copperman. We did a group called Neon People Secretly. And all right. Ben was the guy, and he was the one like making sure all of our identities were secret. <laughs> and he put all fake names on us. He's great. And so, yeah, he's been great. <laughs> but it is, when you bring up songwriting, how songwriters aren't paid enough through streaming. You, I think you get paid more to be a background singer than you do a songwriter for the most part, on these tracks. Yeah, it depends and it is, on the song, yeah. yeah. It, it, but st the fact that that's even close to being the case, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a disservice to songwriters all over Nashville and L.A. and New York or wherever they're writing the songs. So and That's why for me, like even just before I even came here to Nashville, why for me, I'm like, it takes zero for me to know a huge song's coming out and just let regular listeners know who wrote it. I would literally just tag their Instagram handle on every review we did, Anytime I just said, this song's amazing, I'd say this is who wrote it. And it takes a second to do it, but mm -hmm. it builds awareness, it builds appreciation, and then if that leads to people streaming more of like what those writers write, or if they ever put out music of their own and people now like recognize their name and they're a fan, then we're helping them out. And I think right now it's a very cool time to be in the world of music and publishing especially, and there's just so many different opportunities to get songs heard. So I know it's getting better, it's going to continue to get better, and I don't know, this is a... This is my job, so I'm very That's crazy, happy to huh? be Isn't here. it crazy? I'm grateful, man. I feel it's, that it's way, too. Sometimes I'm like, this is my freaking job. And, like, it's not like I have we'll a There'll be here. hard days, obviously. There's oh, not, oh, there every day's going to be sucks, easy. And the job sucks sometimes. <laughs> but every job is supposed to suck a little bit. Yeah. So it's it's amazing. So Congratulations. Yeah. I get to listen to a song and decide how that makes me feel. And if it makes me feel really great, I'll tell a couple other people. And hopefully we can build some momentum to get some great songs heard. And it makes you feel bad. You push delete. And then no one ever hears the song again. I will never. <laughs> no, you heard what yeah, I haven't said. Done, haven't done Delete. it yet. Haven't done it yet. Listen, congratulations. I appreciate it. That's awesome. It, your story's amazing. Just You were just doing your thing. That's it. Just do your thing passionately. I thought that's, that's it. how it's supposed to go, but I guess for me, I can never visualize it for myself until yeah. it happened, and um, now I'm here. It's, it's a wildlife around here. As we mentioned in the pre- at the Benji Chord, C H O R D, the Benji Chord. It feels like one of those bar curves I can't quite play because my fingers are weak. Because I can do G and D and A and E, but when and I can do F. But then once it gets to some of the, uh, the Benji Chord's hard. You know, when I play the Benji Chord. Someone asked me if it was a play on words with bungee Chord. Someone like messaged uh, me that I was like, no, I literally play. I like guitar, and I don't know. That happens every now and then. I get that message. Is that not your real name? You don't have to say your real name. Yeah, my name is Benji Chord. Benjamin. Cord. Cord? That's not your real name, though. But that is not a last name. Does someone have... I've heard the core... I've heard... I don't think Cord's a last name. Oh, I know Cord. I know some Cords. Some Cords? Yeah, but when I came... I, I always thought your last name was Benji Cord. That is not my last name. That is an alias. Okay, well, listen. I live by an alias, so <laughs> no judgment for me. Mike, did you know that wasn't his real last name? Yeah. I never knew that wasn't his That's real last hilarious. name. That's hilarious. Yeah, but sometimes people go, Bones isn't your real last name? And I'm like, you idiot. Of course it's not my real last name. That did happen though. I went to the Opry recently to catch one of my art, one of my favorite artists play his uh, debut, and like they put my name as Ben Cord, so I could not get in. Like, to, and now would have like, been like, oh Ben, I got oh, turned Benji's away. Here. I, I got turned away when I'm like, what's your first and last name? I say, and they're like, you're not on the list, and like oh, they're like man. turning me away. Then like I got a call, and they're like, no, no, we got you. That's happened with tickets. They'll put it under Bobby Bones, and I'm like, ID. Okay, well here's the thing though, man. Before you <laughs> before you say no, it's it's actually. Listen, congratulations. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me on. Really cool. And I know we hit you up because Mike and I have been talking about you for a while, and he's like, let's hit him up and see if we'll come up. And so it's been awesome. Mike, anything you want to say? Uh, how is your quest for the perfect gym going? It is. And your arms I, are huge. I do. I, it took me everything not to make a curl joke or a – go ahead. I did, I'm did. i doing Planet Fitness on the weekdays early because you can't – when you go, like, after work, people are going to be, like, like swinging from – the equipment, you know, like, like it's a jungle or whatever. But I, on the weekends is when I go to the random gyms in town, the, like the nice ones that people recommend to me, and like they'll give me like a trial to try it out. And I've gone to three of them so far. And I think for me it's like the place I'm at right now is like the Airbnb I'm staying at, and it's like maybe 15 minutes away from town. But until I'm like this is where I'm going to be permanently, I don't sure. want to be invested. But there's some really nice ones. So if you all know any 
and have any like you know recommendations for me, I'm always open ears for a perfect gym. And that. I don't feel like I'm qualified to tell. Look at your arms and your shoulders. I'm I a simple. I, I'm, I'm a simple qual- guy when no, it comes to the gym, yeah, though. I don't I need too much. Just I give need me, you to tell me. Yeah, that's the whole <laughs> just point. Give, we give, were just like, give me a boulder. Give me a boulder. I'll figure it out. You know what I mean? All right, you guys follow at the Benji Cord on Instagram. Benji, good to see you, buddy. Great to see you too, man.